Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second in our series of artists and interviews for our upcoming 21-22 concert series. On this occasion, I have asked both our artistic advisor and narrator of the Young Beethoven concert, George Zuckerman, and Beethoven scholar Marcel Bergman, to discuss the theme and musical content of the concert we have planned for November the 7th, now scheduled for November 2021. Take it away, gentlemen. Hello, Oceanside. The last time when we met in October, I had the pleasure of introducing you to the Bergman duo and their missing third member of the Picassiano Ensemble. And at that time, I interviewed Marcel Bergman. This time, we're going to reverse things. Marcel is going to interview me because your November concert is a program called The Young Beethoven. Now, don't worry. I haven't played my bassoon for 15 years now. I wish I could, I'd love to, but luckily I sold my instrument. I'm not going to inflict it on you. But with my colleagues and friends with whom I've worked for so many years, I did create the idea of the young Beethoven. And it's an immensely successful tour, which before COVID struck, was going to play for 15 communities throughout BC. It was going to be a very successful program. Beethoven, strangely, has never had a complete catalog of his music created by anybody. I think everyone knows about the Kirchel catalog, the listing of Mozart's works. There is the R catalog, which lists all of Schubert's, of uh, Vivaldi's works. There is a D catalog for Deutsch, that lists all of Schubert's works. There is even a G catalog for Gerard, listing all the works of Boccherini. But although Beethoven was perhaps the greatest composer of all times, there is no immense catalog. We have a concept of three great periods of Beethoven's music, early, middle, and late. And most of his music falls into that category very easily. But believe it or not, there is a fourth period. And the fourth period is called W-O-O, from the German Werke ohne Opussal, works without opus numbers. And there are an amazing number of works that never received their opus numbers, including some very well-known works. Für Elisa, the work, the piano work that almost everyone in the world knows and perhaps even plays, is a W-O-O, a Werke ohne Opetzal. But among those other works, there are sketches, there are incomplete works, and there are an astonishing amount of early works that are very seldom heard. I decided to put them together, and Marcel and I are going to talk a little bit about that early half period before the early period of Beethoven. Great idea, George. Uh, thank you so much for uh, doing this. Uh, there's a lot to talk about, certainly. And I would like to stay for a moment with the Werke ohne Opus Zahl, because uh, a lot of these works are from his early period in Bonn, before Beethoven actually went to Vienna, where he remained for the rest of his life. Uh, a lot of variation cycles, actually, had never got an opus number. And it's very interesting that the, the Opus One, what became the Opus One by Beethoven, were three piano trios. But he had actually written variations of a Sevuol Ballade from the Nozze di Figaro by Mozart. And Artaria, who was the publisher, published that actually at the first work. And then they said, so this should actually be Opus Two, the trios. But Lichnowsky, who was one of Beethoven's patrons, major patrons, and especially in the early period, really wanted that as Opus One. But one of the problems that we're going to run into, and that I'm going to discuss later, 
the opus numbers are not always exact. Opus 1 is certainly early period. Right. Opus 59 are the great string quartets, and they are certainly in the middle period. Opus 131 is a great string quartet, obviously in the later period. But Opus 104 was written while he was still in Bonn. Right. It just got published later, so it received a late opus number. And that is very confusing, and it's also the case with Opus 81b. Opus 81a is Les Adieux, is a sonata from the later period, but Opus 81b, which is will be part of your program, yes. is a sextet, and it is from the this young This makes days. life difficult. So you have to listen for a moment to a litany of incredible creative energy between 1795 and 1802, when Beethoven is between 25 and 30 years of age. Opus 15, his first piano concerto. Opus 16, a great quintet for piano and winds. Opus 17, the only sonata that Beethoven wrote for a single wind instrument, for French horn. And why French horn? Because he heard an incredible horn player, a virtuoso by the name of Giovanni Punto, who was going around Europe showing that the horn did not only play hunting music, could, not, could play more than just with the basic valves. And there's another story to this. Beethoven played viola in the orchestra in Bonn for the court. And in his midst, in the orchestra, was a colleague, a young man by the name of Silbeck, who became a publisher, was also, Sim, Simrock, excuse me, who became a publisher. And he was also a horn player. And Simrock and Punto were together in Bonn when Beethoven heard a Mozart quintet for horn and strings. And when Punto approached him and said, can you write a quintet like that for me? Beethoven said, I can do better than that. And he wrote a sextet for Punto and Simrock for two horns. He killed two birds with one stone. Maybe he was lazy, he didn't want to write two, two quintets. But it's a wonderful work. It didn't get published till many years later became 81B. Right. But going on with the litany of the, of the opus numbers, opus 15, opus 16, opus 17, the horn sonata, opus 18, the great string quartets, the first group of six quartets, six opus quartets. 19, the second piano right. concerto, opus 20, Septet. the septet that we play on the young Beethoven, opus 21, the first symphony. Okay, and now I have to stop you because now we are at the year 1800, which was actually a pivotal year for Beethoven. He had firmly established himself, you know, as an important classical composer who was kind of in the footsteps of Mozart and Haydn, and he was ready to come completely into his own. And what's so interesting about this music, you know, that the septet and the first symphony were presented in the first concert, together, like an important public concert for Beethoven on These April 2nd. These huge concerts with 20 people. Right, I mean, they were, with they were so long. With... But he, he explicitly wanted the septet to be heard with the symphony together. I think it's definitely not a coincidence. Now, of course, the septet uh, and the symphony both, the uh, symphony number one and the septet were actually among the most popular works of Beethoven during his lifetime. And actually, the first symphony was the favorite. And, um, and uh, so was the septet. It's very interesting how that perception has changed since no, then. The septet was always popular to the point that Beethoven said, wrote to his brother, he said, I wish they would burn that piece because nobody is listening to anything else that I've written. And the septet, interestingly, was the last work that Beethoven wrote utilizing wind instruments as soloists. His wind instruments in the orchestra are extensively used, but Beethoven up until Opus 20, the septet, used the winds. And some of our works in the early, in the young Beethoven are from the W.O.O. period, the own uh, Opus number. 
And one of them is an amazing quintet for a combination of instruments that nobody, nobody had ever conceived of, and nobody has ever conceived of since. Three French horns, one clarinet or oboe, because he wrote it first for clarinet and then changed it later himself for oboe, and one bassoon. Unusual combination. And the three horns in particular reflects Beethoven's interests. He knew Punto, he knew Simrock, he had experienced the quality of the, the sound of the horns, and everywhere in his symphonic writing later on, the horns emerge. Well, he's bringing back the three horns, of course, in the scherzo of the Eroica. The scherzo of the Eroica. Which is very <laughs> unusual, and it's fantastic, and it has to sound like that. So all of these pieces that we are dealing with in this program are really, in a way, uh, very experimental, and you can really feel in the combinations, in the unusual combinations, in the string and winds, couplings in the soloistic uh, treatment of the of the horns, for instance, in the sextet, that is evident throughout, uh, you really feel that he was working towards maybe trying things out for the big symphonic form, and that might explain why after this first symphony he never wrote for these combinations. Very interesting, but I think it does make sense in a way. It is very often said that the septet was a preparation for a symphony, it's a, a miniature symphony. Right. Schubert copied the octet, also considered a work halfway between chamber music and symphonic. It is also reflecting something very interesting in the economics of music. Music was at this time just beginning to move out of the courts into the concert halls. And in the concert halls, the impresario, whoever was putting the concert on, unfortunately had to make money or else he would lose and not be able to continue. In the courts, they could spend as much as they wanted. It was their privilege. They were paying for what they, what they chose to do. So a septet was a great deal less expensive to put on than a symphony. An octet equally less than a symphony. And I, when I listened to the septet again yesterday, I noticed how orchestral it sounds. It's really amazing how Beethoven uses the seven instruments, basically uh, uh, four strings, uh, four violin, strings. viola, cello, bass, and then the clarinet, bassoon, horn. horn. And there is a theory that he treated the wind instruments in the slow movement of the septet almost like a, a group concerto for the three winds against the backdrop of the four strings. And he certainly, in the scherzo, which we're going to play at the end of this, it's a very short and fast movement, and it is almost like a miniature French horn concerto. Right, absolutely. And uh, the wealth of, I think, of solutions that Beethoven finds how to juxtapose different sonorities, how sometimes the strings versus the winds, as you said, sometimes, you know, very often the, the clarinet and the violin treat each other off in these soloistic kind of very quirky solo passages. So, so we really get so much in the, sec, uh, in the septet and it's a substantial work, it's over 40 minutes. There's not a single moment where you think, oh, this is a really long piece somehow. It goes by so quickly. And yet it's like a serenade with many different movements. It's different, it's more bucolic, it's more uh, traditional from the old style. Absolutely. It, it's, it's written, in a sense, as a reflection of the time before he's going to move into his middle period. Absolutely. And, and that's why that year 1800 is so important. And, you know, Haydn, who of course was his teacher for a while, and, you know, not without problems, their relationship, that would be a, a whole other <laughs> interview if we wanted to talk about that. But basically Haydn followed Beethoven with approval up until basically that point of the septet and the first symphony. After that... Well, he studied with he Haydn, was, but he yes. didn't really learn very much from him. Well, I mean, I don't know if we can say it. I think he probably learned a lot from him, but he often 
talked about that there was a competition too it's very interesting even though Haydn was so much older but Beethoven needed to establish himself so there was a certain kind of almost like animosity at times that's really hard to understand nevertheless he t spoke very highly especially when Haydn you know towards the end of Haydn's life he spoke very highly of him and uh, vice versa Haydn was proud of Beethoven but uh, you know Beethoven studied with Albrecht Berger and Salieri and other composers sometimes behind Haydn's back so there were some problems so uh, you obviously thought very carefully about this program and how to structure it and as you said from duo all the way to the septet featuring a, a lot of music that is rarely ever heard so what do you hope the audience will take away from this program the reality that Everything that emerges in later Beethoven and in the mid-period Beethoven and the great works that we all recognize instantly, whether it's the Ninth Symphony or the, even the Fifth Symphony or the Emperor Concerto, had its genesis in these early works. And the excitement and the, the, the stop to think of it, that, that Beethoven was creating these things for the first time. Nobody had heard these sounds before. He was experimenting with them and making wonderful sounds which captured the imagination of his generation of audience. Absolutely. So I hope that people go home thinking that uh, Beethoven was the, the groundswell, the, the, the rock on which all, so much of the future music was written. Not only his own music, but many others. Undoubtedly. I think it's important to also know who's playing the young Beethoven. And for this, I've put together uh, a remarkable combination of uh, virtuoso players from the Vancouver area. And increasingly in this century, it is more and more possible to do that from our own regional resources. I would think perhaps in the later, latter part of the 20th century, we still tended to look outside Vancouver to find key players. And very often we said, oh, we better bring in a horn player from here, from there, uh, or we better bring in that fantastic clarinet. I mean, Jim Campbell was frequently brought, and I would love to bring Jim, but it's, it's expensive to bring him across the country. And we have now resources in Vancouver. Uh, the program of the young Beethoven is actually being led by a wonderful violinist, a much neglected soloist on our Vancouver scene, Nancy De Novo. And her husband happens to be one of the three virtuoso horn players. And by the way, all of our horn players are also specialists in music of the Baroque period, of the early period. So they understood what the limits were on the horn before Beethoven started pressing them to play what De Ponto and had shown. Yes, and I have possible. to add that there was the modern horn was not invented yet when Beethoven wrote these pieces. No. It's even hard for people to play it now on the modern chromatic horn, so we can imagine how daring it must Beethoven have been. Beethoven heard back Punto. Then. And Punta was going around showing that you could do things with the horn that nobody believed possible. Right. And it's really when you listen to, especially some of the passages in the, in the sextet, it's like, wow, that is just crazy, all right? Really crazy. And so that's part of, you know, of course, Beethoven was consistently pushing the boundaries in any aspect of the music, not just the scope, but also in the piano, he wanted more range, he got more range, right? So it's very interesting. I mean, that's, again, another interview entirely. Maybe we can do this in the future sometime, how technology and composing inform each other and have pushed each other in a way to say, you know, what was there first? Was it, you know, a certain music asks for a certain space or a certain space dictates music? You know, the Gregorian chant would not be possible without big churches with enormous sound. But now I must tell you a little bit about the opening work on the young Beethoven. The opening work is a duet for clarinet and bassoon. And I hate to tell you, but it's quite possible 
that Beethoven didn't write it. So nobody, no, who do you think can wrote prove it? it. It's, it's, uh, there are so many theories about it. There are those who argue fervently that it is. It sounds like Beethoven. It sounds like early Beethoven. It's a charming work. It's a beautiful overture for the whole program. It sets the mood. And in fact, it creates the mathematical logic of the young Beethoven, which begins with a duo, proceeds to a trio, a movement of a quartet, the quintet, which I spoke about, the sextet for two horns and strings, and finally, the septet. And the young Beethoven, you'll hear it perhaps in 21, 22. And unfortunately, it won't be coming in this season. But as I said, Beethoven waited 250 years to celebrate this year, which is his 250th anniversary. I think he will wait another year and patiently attend the arrival of the young Beethoven in the season 21-22.